Hello, my name is Ken Kinter. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University, and the purpose of this presentation is to provide an introduction to critical incident debriefing, or CID. As usual, my contact information is on the bottom of the slide. I do want to add that this is meant to be uh, rather specific and that it's being provided to New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals. Uh, so this program is being overseen by clinicians. It's not meant to be viewed as a video and then go out and do a critical incident debriefing. There's a lot more training involved. It's really just an introduction to the topic. So with that, let's get started. And let's start with a few definitions. First of all, we have critical incident. Uh, critical incidents involve potential danger, something that usually, usually happens uh, out of the ordinary. Um, the state psychiatric hospitals, this may uh, be consistent with being assaulted by a patient or a, a patient suicide, either attempt or a completion, or hypothetically speaking, a, a global pandemic, something like that. Debriefing is a technique used to help that person process that incident. When something really out of the normal and, and potentially dangerous happens, sometimes people have a difficult time responding to that. It takes them a little while to get that back together again. And when the incident happens at work, it can be difficult for that person to function at home. And of course, for that person to come back to work where that happened and go back to doing their job kind of as normal. Uh, there's a lot of pressure especially in the helping professions to just kind of shrug this stuff off, but it has a cumulative effect and eventually it affects a person's self-care and their job uh, performance. So why? Why do, why do we do this debriefing? Well, the most basic thing is to help, uh, to help reach out to someone. I'm guessing you have a very difficult job. If you are exposed to violence uh, or if violence is a regular occurrence at your work, this becomes very difficult. We can't trivialize it just because it happens frequently. We're trying to reduce burnout, compassion fatigue, traumatization, and re-traumatization. My belief is that most of us in the helping professions are carrying a little personal and professional or vicarious trauma around, and this adds to it. One of the major things we've seen that leads to trauma turning into post-traumatic stress disorder is when that person feels like they were put in, in a, a situation where they were treated unfairly or they did not have proper backup. The idea of the debrief is counter to that. We're actually trying to help instead of, okay, just deal with it and go back to work. We may also touch on pre-existing traumas, which have occurred before, both in and outside of work. Whenever you go into one of these, there may be some leftover stuff from before. We're helping people to be more effective at work and also more present in their life with their loved ones because work carries over. Uh, we try not to do that. We try to leave our personal stuff at the door and our professional stuff at the car when we go back in, into the house, but it doesn't always work that way. This is also meant to be an early detection system for people who might need further help. That one, you know, just talking to it about it with one person is not necessarily going to help. So here's some of the common ways that trauma shows themselves. To the left, we have more of these uh, emotional aspects, shock, anger, anxiety, the withdrawing and avoidance is a pretty significant one. Um, on the right side, more things that are physical and social, such as changes in sleep and appetite. Flashbacks is when we're starting to get the more PTSD symptoms going on. And obviously, uh, someone, if they're operating in a state of trauma, the more traumas that person has or the more severe traumas they have can make them uh, more susceptible to things in the future. And then question marks. Trauma may show up different for different people. It may show up differently for you than it does for me. So this is by no means a complete list. So some of the specifics about doing critical incident debriefing, when we want it to be as soon as possible at, after the incident. Obviously, if the person needs medical attention, that comes first, uh, but we wanna to get to them as soon as possible or as soon as if they're off work for a while, as soon as they return to work. Somebody might feel like they're okay until they have to re-enter the workplace, in which case we wanna check in with them as soon as possible. Where do we do this? A pleasant, safe, quiet place. Um, in psychiatric hospitals, there aren't many of these, but uh, you know, do your best. One of the critical pieces is where you won't be interrupted. Interruptions mess this process up really bad. So if there's a place where you can uh, have dedicated space, that, that would be really helpful. You can do this in a group that was involved with the incident or get people one at a time, depends on availability. Uh, I'd rather get to everybody separately than wait trying to schedule a group of people at one time. You'll get different feedback from a group or from individually as well. If the, if the people or the person involved have a preference, I roll with the preference. Important point, this is voluntary. If somebody doesn't want to talk about it, if they're not ready to talk about it, you just leave the door open <clears throat> for them to talk about it. 
but you don't mandate this. It's also nice if there's any sort of creature comfort there. Uh, food and drink is nice. It's not always possible. One of the first debriefings I saw, uh, uh, staff had just been assaulted, and the first thing the debriefer did was fill a latex glove with ice and give the person that so that they could ice their jaw while they while this was going on. They were actually waiting for um, medical attention. That was a very nice touch. So the steps of the process, and we're going to go through these one at a time. Introductory script, the retelling of the incident, kind of checking in with feelings generated by the incident changes in that person since the incident, and suggestions, two types of suggestions, one for the workplace, how we can avoid these incidents in the future, if at all possible, and suggestions for the person. So this is a sample script that works at um, where I'm working at uh, Ann Klein Forensic Center at this time. The script doesn't have to be automatically like this, but it contains some pretty essential pieces. This is really an informed consent. Uh, you're letting the person know what this is and what this isn't right off the bat. They will not get in trouble for things like this. What they say will be kept confidential with the only exception being uh, if there's a danger to harm of someone, first of all, if they're gonna hurt themselves or somebody else, that goes without saying. But the other one is if they have suggestions that might help prevent these incidents in the future to make this a safer workplace. We put out the intention. The facility wants you to have this. Uh, they want to talk to you. They want you to process this well. They want you to be okay uh, after this. This isn't about blame. As I may have mentioned, it's not part of the disciplinary process. And we're trying to get as many people involved in this as possible. I like to send out the message that this is something we do with everybody after a critical incident because we care about you and want you to be okay. I think that's the central message. So those pieces are in here. You might find your own way to do it. The next part, too, the retelling. Have the person tell the whole story about what happened. And you kind of want it to follow a chronological order. You may have multiple people, and then you may have, you may have people speak one at a time, or you may have people chime in from where their place is, but let them do it. They'll, they will tell the story. Even if you know the facts, let them tell it. How they see the facts, their interpretation of the facts is more important than your recollection and whether those recollections line up. Let them talk. There's a benefit to playing dumb in this whole thing because people will tell you more if you don't know. Um, if people bring up feelings, that's a beautiful thing. We don't discourage that. Uh, we'll have a special time for that later. Some people go right to the feeling place. Some people are all facts. We want to get both. So get the facts. If you can get the feelings now, that's wonderful. If not, we do that next. Um, and again, we let them talk. Let them do the talking. We don't want to get caught in the war stories. I mean, if you're familiar with what they've been through, that's a good thing. They know you've been there. You don't have to say it. One of the key skills when someone's in this position is validation. Validate their emotions. If they felt scared, you're like, well, that sounds scary. If they were angry, you're like, I get why you're angry. It's not justifying any sort of behavior or anything. You're just joining them in that feeling. And you may actually have those feelings. You may have been in that same exact situation. But whatever their feeling is, the feeling is valid at that point in time. Out the other warning about this part is let's not get caught up in the war stories. We're not trading this off. They may be through an incident that is nowhere near as severe as an incident that you've been through, and that's okay. Uh, it, it's really up to them at that, at that point in time. The next part is just asking about any changes. Have they noticed anything different about themselves since this incident happened? Things about their work habits, you see the list here. Anything that's changed, uh, sleep and appetite is a really good barometer. Um, I also like asking about self-care stuff. So I'm a big fan of those. Any changes, because again, a temporary change is a normal state of affairs to dealing with a traumatic incident. But when it gets to you know, days, weeks, over a month, if it hasn't changed or if it's getting worse, it may be a sign of something more, um, more severe setting in. So suggestions for the workplace. As I mentioned, this is the part. Feel free to take notes on this part, um, you know, and tell them, look, we, we don't want this to happen to anybody else. What's something that could have been done or maybe could be done going forward to help prevent this or to minimize it in the future? We're not blaming anybody. It's all in the name of safety. And we get better by looking at where these critical incidents happen. The more critical incidents we have and we problem solve for, the better shape we should be in. And then suggestions with, for the person. What are they doing to take care of themselves? Very often people have that idea right off. They're going to take some time off. They're going to do this. They're going to go home and see their family, et cetera, et cetera. Great. 
The more of that, the better. Do they need a referral to uh, EAS or it's called an EAP in different places? Just very short term, just a couple sessions to touch base with them. Um, if they want any more than that, uh, that could be encouraged as well. If they want to see a therapist or if they're linked with any sort of treatment now, we should definitely encourage that in the short term. We want to normalize that and say, look, this is, that's a good thing to do after you're in a situation like what you've been through. Um, you help them out with a plan as far as what happens if this doesn't hit right away. Some people go right into the emotional place right away. With some people, it takes a lot longer. With some people, it won't kick in until they've re they return to work or even after they've returned to work. So what's the plan for self-care? What are they going to do to do increased care for self while this happens? Um, and I would ask them, what are you doing to take care of yourself right now? Uh, those of us in helping professions aren't always so good at the self-care piece. Two other pieces, leave the door, the door open for them to come to you later on. Say, look, this doesn't have to be the end of this. Keep me posted about what's going on and get their permission for you to check in with them. Are things okay? Have things changed? Do you need anything? You know, it, one of the best ways you stay in touch with someone, that way you've established that connection to that person. They don't feel like they're, uh, they're on their own. So a couple pieces uh, for you, the, de the debriefer or debrief fest, debrief us. I don't know, I don't know how that works. First of all, don't do these on your own. Um, they should, you should be working in uh, conjunction with someone who's licensed, someone who's a trained professional uh, in this area. You may know the job best. This may be one of your peers, which is why you're a really good person to approach them. You know the job, but have someone that you can go to if there's any questions, if there's any problems. Don't do your first one alone. Do your first one with someone so you can see how they do it and kind of get a feel for, for how it goes. No debriefing is perfect and no two are the same. I've been doing some version of these for 30 years. I've never had two go the exact same way. It's kind of like first aid. Uh, you want to do it and you want to do it effectively. There really isn't a, a perfect. And uh, last but certainly not least, remember, you're doing a good deed here. You are helping to create a safer, trauma-informed workplace for you and your coworkers. And that means that you rock. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions, you've got my contact information on the first slide, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. And check out uh, some of our other videos in this area. We have lots of other stuff on trauma and crisis and things like that. Take care.